And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer to the temple, coming to us all the way from the Crit Academy, where, pe where people either graduate or, fa or fail, no in-betweens. <laughs> and and developer of the upcoming um, superhero RPG using Five E's framework, Capes and Crooks. The one, the one and only Justin Handlin. Hopefully, I got hopefully I got the pronunciation right. Yep, I be handling my business. That's yep. the best way to remember it. <laughs> yeah, how, how you doing? How you doing today, man? Oh, I am blessed. Thank you so much, Mildra, for having me on. This is really exciting. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> so. One of my traditions is to open with the humble beginnings, in a sense. Okay. So with that in mind, I'd like I'd like you I'd like you to walk me through your first introduction to role playing games and what was it that made it stick. Oh geez, Whew. yeah, that's a long time ago. Um, so I am uh, in my mid thirties right now, so it's been a while. My first experience was with uh third edition mm -hmm. and my buddy is like hey you really like playing those final fantasy games why don't you why don't you come out and hang out with me and my friends and play dungeons and dragons and i'm like i would rather stay home and play final fantasy to be honest and uh but he he convinced me to go so i so i went and mm -hmm. i made the mistake of picking a fighter for my first time uh, so here I am with my big giant sword and ready to take on, take on the, the evil and everything. And, um, I didn't really know how to role play. So I really just kind of sat around really quietly at first and I didn't really engage very much. Uh, the character creation process drove me bonkers. Uh, I was just like this, I, we just spent like five hours playing this and I haven't even swung a sword yet. People What's the deal, you know? Because I didn't really understand. I was young, probably around a little before 10 years old. Um, but we ended up, uh, he managed to sucker me into coming back, which I wasn't super interested in. But we finally got into thick of combat and in the, the, the story of, you know, this dragon attacking this wizard's tower and blah, blah, blah. Got to climb the tower, fighting the dragon's minions and everything. And it really, the moment that it made for me was when we were fighting the... Uh, the dragon's rider at the top of this tower while the dragon was, you know, trying to scorch everything to death. And I was just like, this guy's going to kick our butts. <laughs> um, I, I, the only thing I could think of, I've got like four hit points left. So I grab onto the guy and I push us both off the edge. Mm -hmm. And I will never forget that moment. <laughs> like after that happened and I went home, I realized that it was more than just a game. It was more than any video game that I had played because that was so clear in my mind of something that I wanted and that I was able to achieve that no video game would let me do unless it was scripted to. And it was that moment that I think I was hooked. But man, if I wouldn't have played after that first game, I probably wouldn't have gone back. <laughs> so that was that was my first D and D uh, kind of short short. It wasn't a one shot. It took place over three sessions, mm -hmm. but uh, it was a lot of fun. And that was my first introduction to Dungeons and Dragons and the world of role playing games. Yeah. Now, th now, obviously, obviously that was a while. Obviously, that was a while ago. But um, oh yeah, did you, there's there's some people who are one system lifers, and there's some there are some that jump that jump around. Um, which did, were you? Did you largely stick within the um, D and D umbrella over the years, or did you jump? Did you experiment with other games? Over, with well, I ended up experimenting, but not by choice. Um, my grandmother and some of my family members had their reserves about Dungeons and Dragons being the work of Satan. Oh, um, no, those. So. So instead of playing Dungeons and Dragons for a while, we had to play the catastrophe that was Rifts, which I did enjoy. But man, that was much more work to figure out. But uh, My I played Rifts for a while. Yeah, right. 
Um, and then I played that for a little while um, until I got a little bit older and I was able to kind of, okay, I'm going to go play some games with my friends. I kind of just omitted the fact that it was D&D. At this point, I think 3.5 was the thing. There was a long window in there where I didn't play a whole lot of anything, but I did get into, uh, into uh, Gamma World. Mm-hmm. And I played that for a while, and that was just that was awesome. If you haven't played Gamma World, highly recommend it. I am. Um, but but for the first for the first while, it was mostly kind of just those three games. It wasn't until uh, fourth edition came out and fifth edition and fifth edition following it that I really started to experiment and play other genres: Savage Worlds, Thirteenth Age, which is awesome. Mm-hmm. Both of those are awesome. Uh, Fate Core is really good. Um, trying to think of some other ones. I really want to play Numenera. I have it, but we haven't played yet. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, I really would like to get more into that. But uh, so I do have a larger, broader look at games. I played Pathfinder for a while, um, but for some reason, Fifth Edition has sucked me in like no other uh, edition of any game has. Yeah. So. Now that brings me to. To this idea, to this idea with capes and crooks, the mm-hmm. the idea of doing a a superhero RPG using using Five E's framework. Um, now, whenever whenever there's the talk about doing su- about doing superheroes with D twenty, um, the name that inevitably gets brought up is mutants and masterminds. Yes. Um, was that was that a game that you had that you had exper- that you had experience with in the past? Much more recent than that, I played Mutants and Masterminds uh, a couple years ago. Well, one of my co-hosts on the show is a big fan, mm-hmm. so it was inevitable that I would be brought into you know playing that. Um, and I did really enjoy it, and I think uh, Mutants and Masterminds is still based off of the D20 system, as you mentioned, mm-hmm. with some alterations, which is why I believed when I decided to do Capes and Crooks that it could work because I had already seen it succeed. Um, so now I just had to come out with a way to make it more engaging and different than 5th edition to make it super. Um, and so that's kind of where it started. And there was other superhero uh, games that we had played. Um, icons, uh, masks. Mm-hmm. So we kind of have gotten it around uh these last few years um, playing those. But the one thing that I decided is like, you know what? I think fifth edition can do this a little bit better than some of these. Mm -hmm. Um, And that was a task that I decided to, to undertake upon myself. (laughs) Yeah. Um, I do remember, I do remember getting my hopes up for a, for a similar project not too long ago called supers and sorcery, but that ended, that ended up, uh, but that, but I ended up backing out on my interest with that one because it was not, it was, not what I was hoping it was. What it it was yeah. basically it was still doing the fantasy trappings, just trying to in, just trying to insert superheroes and um mm-hmm. when somebody he, when somebody hears a name a name like that kind of thing, that's not exa- that's not exactly what they're shooting for. They right. they want they want as the ter- as the term has become the, has become um, parlance nowadays cape shit. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's funny. I hadn't heard of that. That's great. Um. <laughs> But, but yeah, they if and the the idea of t- if if you put if you put super if you put superheroes in still a fantasy setting, that's just lipstick on a pig. <laughs> would, <laughs> would it be fair? Would it be fair of me to say that that's not what's going on with Capes and Crooks? This is a this is a full on no no bullshit superhero RPG using so... the edition framework. The structure for the mechanics is fifth edition, but mm-hmm. the setting and some of the alters it, it did require a little bit of altering to make it feel super. But it is not a fantasy setting. It is, if anything, closer to cyberpunk than anything else. Um, because we took Terra into the future where there's you know f- magic and fantasy, uh, or uh, science and science and um, superpowers i guess Mm because in this world powers hadn't existed up until about 25 years ago there was stories and lore of ancient magic so there's some of that around like you can be kind of a spellcaster like uh the sorcerer supreme if you want to Mm -hmm. but for the most part it is more of a cyberpunk 
Um, I mean, there's aliens in it and that sort of stuff that have, you know, come and visited and brought their tech and knowledge. And that's where we kind of wanted to focus it. The superheroes um, comes from the fact that people have found themselves with these gifts recently and now want to do what they can to, you know, help, which is the whole thing of being a superhero is I just woke up after being bitten by an insect and now can stick to the walls. What am I going to do with this? Well, I'm going to go help people. But that other guy is not. Um, and that's a problem. And so that's really what we think the core of making a superhero is getting rid of the, the uh, well, I hate to say it, murder hoboing is a thing that can only exist, in my opinion, in like fantasy, because it's just accepted that adventure is going to do what they're going to do. And capes and crooks, we figured if we wanted this to succeed, that had to be the first thing to go. So in this world, the law is still trying to understand and learning how to deal with people. So vig being a vigilante, still against the law, still get you arrested if you get caught. Mm -hmm. Murdering people, get you, get you <laughs> arrested and or worse. Um, there are some points of talking about having people's powers removed from them. So when they do these bad things, they no longer can be a cape or a crook. They just become normal people. But luckily, technology is advanced enough that they can still continue down that road if they really wanted to. Um, so that's kind of how we thought that in order to make it seem super, that there has to be punishment for doing things that are bad, period. Something that fantasy never seems to cover very well, I think. And we handle that with what's called the public opinion system. Instead of alignment, you basically have a, a, a line that you move back and forth from one end to the other. And some people will help you and some people won't, depending on where you kind of fall on that line. And that also determines how the NPCs, the police, the DRT, how they interact with the hero. Um, if your public opinion starts to sway one way, you can get more help from the villainous type NPCs, but not so much from the ones that are good and, and want to, you know, do what's right. Um, mm -hmm. And we think that that's the core of making it a, a superhero. But the fifth edition mechanics are still prevalent. Um, and largely that's because... In my experience, it's easier to transition to a system when you already know the rules. And since 5th edition is such a, a big game, it's easier to get people on board with trying it out than trying to learn a whole new system, which I've always struggled with because it takes too much time. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that... Did that answer your question? Yeah. Now, that that does bring me to to the to the nitty-gritty of things. Um, mm -hmm. But... but, but before before but um before I get before I get into that there is one other um aspect that I wanted to I want I wanted to, I wanted to dip into okay and that that is um now we t we talked about mu we talked about mutants and masterminds but I'm mm -hmm. curious if I'm curious if um what I'm curious what the what experience um prompted you to to put to um put forth put forth um capes and crooks <laughs> Yes, we covered a product on our show, Crit Academy, called uh, Carbide City, I think. And that moment, when I read through that, at the end of the show, I said, guys, this is an awesome product, but I think, I think we might be able to do better. I think we can do better because it took the fourth edition or the fifth edition rules and basically gave you a hero that was essentially a monster. Mm -hmm. um, it was basically a monster stat block. And we're like, well, this is really cool. It works really well. We played through it. We had a blast. It was very super. But I was like, but there's no choice. The choices are so minimal. What makes superhero games so much fun is you can completely customize your hero in any way you can think of. And that's what was missing. I was like, I think we can do this better. So I tossed a couple concepts together and the guys are just like, dude, this could really work. Um, and then it kind of just progressed from there. Um, so that's kind of what spurred it all on to mm -hmm. be honest now when it when it comes to the when it comes to the comic book and and end of end of things um mm -hmm. what was your gateway drug on that front oh dude spawn <laughs> <laughs> now i'm the one spawn. handing out cool points <laughs> <laughs> yes spawn was my my first gateway drug i had a friend who was big into comics and then I was over his house one day, and of course uh, there was a uh, God. I don't even remember which one it was. It wasn't even. It was like it wasn't even one of the first ones. But uh, I read. I was like, dude, this is some violent stuff, man. What's going on? He's like, yeah, that's Spawn. He really kicks some ass. I mean, mind you, we're I'm like ten, you know. 
Mm-hmm. And I was like, this is so cool. And so he gave me a couple and then a couple more. And then I kept coming back. And for years, that's I read comics and I got into this, this, the superhero thing. I finally fell in line uh, more love for like the Spider-Man character uh, mm-hmm. because I felt like I could relate to him more than any of the other ones. And that really is where I truly am like, there, there's more to these than just cool colored pictures and interesting stories. Um, it almost ties to my life of what I could be, what I could do. Um, obviously, I think every kid feels that way at some point, you know. Mm-hmm. But that's kind of how it all started with Spawn, man. Yeah. <laughs> and man, was I let down by that movie. <laughs> um, I when it when it came to the when it came to the live action movie, I um, I get I. I, I treat it as I treat it as a all right for for its time, especially especially considering yeah. that um technically technically speaking that was a independent project. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean new I mean it had new line new line was new line was distributing it, but um the but the film studio involved with it that was to, that was Todd because Todd McFarlane has this whole thing of of the of the mantra of fuck it I'll do it myself. <laughs> yeah, which is which is how is and it works is, for him. <laughs> yeah, um, and he's he's a, he has self he has self admitted to being a, to being a bit of a bit of a asshole because he grew up hearing all the stories about how um about how Jack Kirby got got screwed by the big two and he had no desire to um fall into that trap. So his right, mindset right. is, I'm gonna fuck you before you can fuck me. Um, <laughs> but when. But um, at one point he was he was approaching um, he was approaching he was approaching Mattel and I think ha- I think um, Hasbro regarding regarding a toy deal regarding a toy deal because merchandising it was the nineties um, right right but both of them both of them turned him down so he said fuck it I'll start my own toy company <laughs> and, that's great that's and a and th- and that particular company is still going around I'm I'm pretty sure. Sh- I'm pretty sure the um, animated Spawn didn't disappoint you as much, though. No, not at all. Um, and honestly, after things like... the, So I started really getting to anime, and the more I see stuff like Castlevania coming out, I feel like that is a better medium in most cases mm. um, than, than trying to make stuff in a movie. Like, when I found out Brendan Sanderson was going to make um, this porn series um, live action, I was... I'm, I'm very apprehensive. I feel like it would do better as like a, a Castlevania anime Spawn style uh, series than that, but that's personal preference, I suppose. Mm-hmm. Seems easier to pull off inner monologue and stuff like that, which I feel like is core to some of those um, comics and, and books and stuff. There's also there's also the fact that um, I've I've seen I now. I've seen I've seen some say that do, that doing it doing it animated would be less expensive than doing it live action. Um, that's not true. Really. Um. I I'm not gonna whether it it, it would be a loss in the weeds thing about whether or not it's more or less expensive, but it, it but um qual, but quality animation does not come cheap. Oh, um, for sure. A sing a single. Like a, a single ep- a single episode of say Avatar: The Last Airbender, um, mm-hmm. on the cheap is still is still is still going to be at least a million dollars. Yeah. Um. And that and that was that was and I'd imagine the cost has only has only gone up has only gone up since then. Right. I'm pretty I'm pretty sure the I'm pretty sure the the um, animations that you see that you see coming from coming from that studio that's that's handling that handled um. Castlevania is handling as handling a few other projects isn't isn't going to come easy. Um, right. That be, that being that being said, I do th- I do think that Mistborn is something that should be animated and not and not in live action simply because when just when just when it comes to when it comes to um <laughs> when it comes to the magic systems in Mistborn espe- especially especially pushing and pulling like that's that's the kind of stuff where you're gonna need to invest. You're gonna need to invest in wire in some of the wire work people in Hong Kong, or you're or you're <laughs> gonna have to or worse have to CG it up. And dear God, I hope that doesn't happen. Right. Um. 
Yeah, that's that's and it's for me it's even more than just the the action. Mm -hmm. One thing that's really big in good books is internal monologue and the mental struggles that are going on and how people react. Mm -hmm. In Storm Stormlight Archives and in uh the Mistborn series and even in uh the um other other products he's done, that's very much something that can't really be captured by a facial expression and movies don't do voiceover um exposition very interesting like animations can do it mm -hmm. um and that's just justin's opinion which you know i'm not an expert in any of this stuff You're i just think that it's it works better in that sort of medium than like a uh a, a live action flick you're not the only one to think that because um a lot of people i've discussed on with, with on the matter have have st have stated that um animation is at its best with exaggeration. Yes. Um, yes. Although when although when it com when it comes to when it com when it comes to pe when it comes to the whole prospect of prospect of a live action um I'll believe it when I see it <laughs> cuz I yeah. cuz I hear I hear about these kind of things all the time to the point when I was doing my news show I um put I put a soft block on them simply because there there wasn't a whole lot of meat to them. Mm -hmm. um, like I I remember I remember when the news when the news dropped that the Otori books went, might be getting an adaptation and nothing's come of that. Mm. Um yep. and per, per you want to wait till there's an official announcement. My policy is trailer or get the fuck out. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> and even even, th even uh, though then I do think that that was um, that was in one of uh, one of the Brandon Sanderson updates that I watched. He did talk about writing the screenplay for that and how different it is from writing a book. So that might have some wheels. Of course, it might still get shot down. I guess <laughs> um, there was a point in time where a where a rifts movie was act was actively was actively entertained and oh, yeah? the and the script is 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 pub is publicly av is publicly available on them mm -hmm. on um it didn't go nowhere website. yeah it did it didn't go it didn't go anywhere even though Ke even though kevin th was dead set sure it was going to mm -hmm. um but it di but it didn't and may maybe it's for the best because kevin would have probably wanted to have wanted to have um random parts um, re re edited and re and rearranged at the last second, like he does his books. <laughs> That's funny. Yep. Uh, All critics have their whipping boys, and Palladium has been has been mine for twenty years. Right. Um, <laughs> now, the one of the reasons that I w that I was curious about the origins with ca with capes and crooks has to has to do with um how with the relationship between origin and role now since you mentioned masks i can kind of see it come from there but mm -hmm. one of the things that ended up coming ended up coming to mind as I, as i was going through this maybe maybe because maybe because this it's been the it's been the only case where people got it right was city of heroes love city of heroes mm -hmm. man why is there not a big public private server for that stuff anyway um, i'm sorry it's a rant um, on there, for another day uh, there is. Well, then you're gonna me and you're gonna have a chat after this. Because <laughs> yeah. City of Heroes and City of Villains was phenomenal, mm -hmm. and while I really like uh, DC Universe, it is no uh, City of Heroes. No, now uh, the now um as I as I understand it with character creation, um, you're you're picking a you're picking an origin and then a then a um. Than a role. Um, now, when it when it came to when it came to designing this kind of thing, did you ha did you initially have intentions of do of doing a of doing a an analog to the to the race class dichotomy, or did or did you feel that you have that you had to modify that to fit? The goal here was to provide a set of bonuses based on how the player wanted to receive their powers. And honestly, once again, 5th edition already nailed a bunch of stuff, so we weren't going to reinvent the wheel, mm. though we did make them a little bit more potent than like the races in 5e. Um, 
and that's intentional because once again they're super um and they needed to be different enough beyond just a few stat points and that's where i think origins really begins to separate from its analog sister the races because uh aside from the stat bonuses the general buffs that you get aren't super different from each other um a really good example would be the experiment if somebody decided they wanted to pick the ex uh, experiment origin they get a constitution increase of one but then they get to choose their following augmentations balance physical or mental so that means balance they can increase two different scores by one or physical they can increase their deck score or their strength score by two mental wisdom and intelligence but then they also get enhanced perception which gains them advantage uh or they in, in addition they have proficiency bonuses doubled for the ability check made with perception that is significantly more potent than anything you would probably find in the races because mm -hmm. basically getting expertise on a very commonly used feature is pretty potent mm -hmm. and that's a real uh, example uh, a good example of it because i don't think 5e races would ever do that um but as an experiment we wanted your stuff to be so much more than everyone else that it really stands out um, and that's kind of how we started started with the uh, development of it. And then it kind of just went from there. Mm -hmm. But we did try to not make them so blatantly powerful that they couldn't be tossed into a five game if you really wanted to. Yeah. Um, um, so there was a hard balance to find there. Mm -hmm. I'd, li I'd like you to go through a few, a few examples so I could, so I could sure. get a grasp on, wh on what would constitute a origin. Okay. And, so, and, okay, so it, we... and what they're going to be giving. So we just talked about the experiment, um, mm -hmm. which is basically they're a result of some sort of experiment, willing or not, right? I mean, Captain America is an experiment, right? Mm -hmm. He does the same thing. He, he's a result of that. Uh, another one would be a uh, the Inhuman. Now, uh, the one thing I want to talk about big time is Inhuman is interesting because it isn't really tied to uh just the earth right mm -hmm. uh the inhumans are basically members of either an alien race or some other strange sentient race um maybe it was something that was hiding under the world forever and finally came out whatever so for instance with the inhuman it's one of the few there's only two uh, origins that give you dark um one thing that we all unanimously agreed dark vision needs to be rarer to make it more potent so the less people that have it, the more useful it is. So we narrowed it down to two of the ten, which made it far stronger um, than its race cousins, because almost every race has dark vision. Um, the other thing we gave it is alien mind, which basically gives them advantage against being charmed or frightened. Um, and they also have advantage on intelligence saving throws against powers. Um, so them having a... a uh, a, a mind uh, that is different than what people expect would inherently grant them some sort of advantage. So not only we kind of compiled uh, the the charmed uh, fey ancestry or something mm -hmm. like that with a couple other powers to give it the the intelligent saving throw because um, we wanted it to be potent enough that would make sense when somebody tries to manipulate them through you know telekinesis or uh through uh tel telepathy not telekinesis through like mm -hmm. telepathy or or charming and so um in addition to that they uh they get their deck score of two and one ability score of their choice increased by one so once again that's a little simpler but it's very potent when they're one of the only few r races that has dark vision, and it's out to 120 feet instead of the traditional 60, mm -hmm. um, which has doubled it. Kind of like the uh, so the Drow, I think, have doubled distance. Yeah. Uh, so that was the kind of the other change. So as far as the the features, that character, no matter what power role they take on, whether it's a a speedster or a uh, a uh, uh, a, a gadgeteer, they're going to stand out just for being a different origin mm -hmm. beyond their powers that they pick, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, uh, now, when I, when, based on how you, based on how you described Inhuman, in um, mm -hmm. would it be, would it be fair of me to, to say that 
um, a lot of the deity archetypes that um, ja that Jack Kirby was famous for um, would qualify under that. Where, where, yes. where, whether it be whether it be things like the Asgardians in Mar in Mar in Marvel or the New Gods in DC, they're still um, they're still just an extreme version of Clark's Law as far as everyone else is concerned. Yes, that would be a very apt description. But uh, and the cool thing is, once again, because it's left to inhuman, the player can add to their own, or the, the overseer, which we call the game master, mm -hmm. can also build a world based around that. I mean, you can have uh, the inhumans can cover from deities to aliens to um, secret beings that have been hidden and have you know come out and uh, from the woodwork or whatever. Come mm -hmm. on, kitty. So you know, oh. trying to think. Uh, go ahead. Now, when it now when it comes to when it come, now when it comes to role, I'm guessing that I'm guessing that is that is the um cla that is the class equivalent, which um bring which yes. does which does present an, does present an interesting um conundrum. You, you, oh, you yeah. look at you look at most soup you look at most supers RPGs. Um, yes, most of them are classless. At best, they yes. are archetype centric. And I've of, I've often I've often I've often joked that that tr that using fu using full on traditional classes in in a in a old in a old school sense for a supers game would be an oxymoron beca because 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 the range of things that, the range of powers that supers have and even in even in just a smaller universe like let's let's use um let's use early let's use the power range for for the cast in the in that first wave of image you know okay. Sa savage dragon young blood unfortunately Sp um spawn wildcats th those kind of guys that's yep. still a pretty wide net that you're casting yes um and fifth edition is n if there's if there's one um if there's one drawback that it has with it with its particular class system is that it's not exa it's not ex it's not exactly aiming for a high degree of custom of customizability. Yes, so, and that's why we change that. <laughs> so that 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 is why the role is going to be one of those elephants in the room. So how similar and how different are you are you guys going when it comes to classes is it relatively similar to traditional classes or is this going to be a case of we got to blow this up so i would say it's somewhere in between so one we agreed 100 percent the 5e structure was not customizable enough i mean you would need a thousand subclasses to make a possible combination so we basically just ripped out subclasses entirely mm -hmm. um so the roles um are similar to classes if you didn't have archetypes. Um, so we basically ripped out the archetypes and said, okay, let's look at some of the iconic heroes, and if we had to categorize them, what type of powers would they have? So let's say you want to play a character like the Hulk. Well, you don't have to go and find every single power that fits it. You pick the Brute, which comes with things like the rage mechanic, for instance, which is just mm -hmm. called ultimate defense, right? Because mm -hmm. it's not rage. It's, it basically grants you resistance to stuff. Mm -hmm. And it grants you a, uh, a powerful uh, brute strength, which means you can do 1d12 with, uh, plus your strength with a punch or unarmed strike. That's a brute mechanic. You can throw debris that's lying around you and chuck it you know, 80 feet if you want. Mm -hmm. um, that kind of fits the brute theme. Now, let's say I want to have a very specific style brute. That's where your power, your at-will powers come into play. So I've picked the brute. I know he's going to be able to absorb damage. I know he's going to have a high, higher, high stamina die, um, which we got rid of the term hit die because it was confusing to people between hit points and hit die. So we call it stamina because mm -hmm. we're going to use it for more than just healing. But that's, a, that's another uh, detail. Um, so now that you've picked the Brute, I've decided I'm going to be the Brute. Let's just say you want to build a Hulk-like character. So then you can go down to the At-Wills and you can pick powers like uh, Aerial Launch, where you hit somebody and knocks them into the air. And then at fifth level, you can then jump up behind them and knock them back to the ground. Mm -hmm. And that fits that kind of core Hulk theme. But let's say I want to be a super damage absorber, but I want to be more like Jean Grey. I want to do it through telekinetics. I want to do it through telepathy. Mm -hmm. Well, by picking the at-will powers that represent that, the only difference in the ultimate defense between the brute 
and the telepath is the brute says I punch, the telepath says I throw out a psionic energy. Mm -hmm. That's really the only difference. So by picking powers that shape your roles, uh, or your powers will shape how your player character interacts with the world and how you define them as a superhero, the role is just there to give you a toolkit of what you would need to fill that role. So mm -hmm. you could pick that role and not take any features or powers related to that role and still be a brute just in a different way. Uh, one of my players, for instance, to, I mentioned the psionics, took a psionic approach where he would throw a punch, but it would be like a, a psionic energy surrounded his hands. Or mm -hmm. he would, you know, point at an object and send it flying. And, and he still could, you know, absorb the energy attacks. He had the most hit die. Um, and that was the role that they wanted to fill. But they got to fill that role in any way that they want. Mm -hmm. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Now, with now that brings me to one other el one other elephant in the room that a lot of superhero games have struggled has struggled with. Let's address the magic question. <laughs> yes. So, uh, the the idea of ma the idea of magic based ca magic based characters is is a is a well worn motif. I mean, you've got you have yep. do, you have Doctor Strange, you have Doctor Fate, you have Sha you have Shadow Man, you've ha you've um you've had plenty you've had plenty of ca of um characters who are all who are all about who are all about the casting, whether it be on those high ends or something on the lower end, like say um Constantine. Um, mm -hmm. I, I love Con I love me some Constantine, by the way. Hell yeah. <laughs> um, Hell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> even even if it was even if it was just Alan Moore's glorified excuse so he could draw Sting. Um, <laughs> That's awesome. I never thought of that. Well, he he's the one who said it, not me. Oh, nice. <laughs> um, but the tree the, now there's been magic. There's been some. There's been a magic pow power list in a lot in a lot of um, Super's games, but a lot of times it ends up being the it ends up being a do anything kind of attribute because trying to trying to give a lot of magic characters in comics a spell list is um, going up shit creek without a paddle. Right, because you're trying to divine it in advance, mm -hmm. and there's no reason to do that. That's one thing that we real recognized early on, which is why. At will powers determine what your character can do along with the role. So if you want to play, I mean, for all intents and purposes, you could classify everything in Capes and Crooks as uh, a, a spellcaster if you wanted. So, for instance, we use the cantrip as a starting point for at will powers. So let's talk a bit about for air launch since I mentioned it already. Mm -hmm. That is structured kind of like a cantrip. So it's got an activation time, casting time or whatever, a bonus action. And then it tells you how long the duration is, which is instantaneous. And you make it basically says you make a powerful uh, upward strike that sends your target flying into the air and falling back to the ground. If you take the attack action on your turn, you can use a bonus action to shove a medium creature uh, on a success. The target is knocked 10 feet into the air. And if they fall back down, they take fall damage. Mm -hmm. That, for all intents and purposes, functionally is a cantrip. But instead of doing magic, it does falling damage. And it takes strength. There's... And that's why I think 5e lends itself so well because of the the innate designs that Wizards has come up with and released by extension by the OGL becomes a new tool. So in Capes and Crooks, we have at-will powers, but they function as a mix of magical powers or physical powers. But to us, it doesn't matter which combination you take. You can take that and still flesh out your character the way you want. Um uh, and but we took it a step further to make it more unique. Is one thing we hated about the generic spellcasting cantrips is they just as you got level stronger they just increased in damage mm -hmm. and that wasn't interesting enough. Enough. So we decided, well, what if at these points where they increase in level and get more powerful, we give them additional features. So I'm gonna follow back up with the air launch. Once you hit, you can knock them into the air. They take ten, you know, they take one d6 fall damage when they land. Mm -hmm. That's not that much. But at fifth level, you can follow up your air launch by leaping into the air and attempt to shove the target again. On a success, you throw a punch or kick or some other 
appendage and the target is knocked back down to the ground, doubling fall damage. So now we just took that at will power, cantrip, whatever you want to call it, mm -hmm. and not only made it more interesting, but it now is more interesting as it scales, which means now you have to look at all the things it can do as it, it gets stronger to see if that's still something you want. Um, and then, of course, it gets stronger uh, at, after that. At 11th level, you grapples have advantage. Um, at 17th level, the height of the target is launched is increased to 20 feet. So when my player started launching stuff off of the second floor of a building, he became a pretty effective character without having to, having to add direct damage to the power. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of how we, we dealt with it. Because we know that it's hard to give an entire subsection a list of powers. Yeah. Um, instead, it's here's all the powers, pick the ones that tickle your dice mm -hmm. and create your own hero. And that was the approach we decided to take. Yeah. Now, do you ha do you when it comes to the at wills, do you have it? Do you have it where e where there's a universal list of at wills or is it a case of there is a there is a slightly smaller pool of at wills for each um, role? No, so that's what the roles are for. The roles are designed to give you the necessary powers that you need to fulfill that role. But there's no limit on the at-wills you can select. You can be a Hulk with the telepath, mm -hmm. um, telepathic powers, which honestly is just grog because, you know, Marvel and DC done already did everything. But um, that's seen before. So if I decide I want to pick the brute and pick up the telepath powers and telekinesis, I basically just say he's furry and I've got grog, you know? <laughs> so it, uh, we figured that it wasn't necessary to limit. If people want to build a character a certain way to emulate their hero, there's their rules are there to do that. But it also allows for deviation from them by not um, funneling, funneling or shoehorning the player into having to pick those things. The only thing that you have to pick is the powers that come with the role. The superpowers, the at will, the signatures, the enhancements, that's all completely customizable. Which is where I think Capes and Crooks really deviates from what 5th edition is. Mm -hmm. Now, that, br that, br that brings me to one, to one other thing. Since you mentioned that um, you're using the spell uh, you're using the spell casting setup as your framework, there are two issues when it, co when it, comes, to, when it comes to 5e spell casting that I... I feel I, I feel I wouldn't be doing my job if if they weren't addressed. Absolutely. Now, the fir the first one, and this is this is one that on the because um on my on my channel I've been do I've been doing a deep dive into the level up five e play test that um Ian mm -hmm. World is putting out, and we had an opportunity to rant a bit about um concentration. We don't yes. we don't like concentration. <laughs> And that's definitely a problem. The the um the big the big re the big reason the big reason why is um, because of the fact that you can only you can only concentrate on one on one spell. Um, it basically makes it, or because concentration is such a drain on your action pool. Um, use getting haste as soon as you can is is almost a requirement. Just so, yeah. just so that you can do much, so you're not just concentrating on a spell constantly and being and being stuck on the being stuck in the back burner in encounters. Um, okay. I mean, obvious, obviously that. So that brings me to the que to the question of when it comes to a, when it comes to a lot of the powers, um, a lot of the, a lot of the spells in in five e are utilizing um, concentration as part of their duration. Is is that is um concentration going to be showing up frequently with the power list for capes and crooks? Yes, but not as much. Um, the reason uh, for, first I'd like to address the concentration limit. Mm -hmm. There is an enhancement that lets you do two. Um, so that was something we had previously considered. If somebody finds it an issue, that they can they can they can take an enhancement that offsets that. Mm -hmm. um, there are powers that require uh, concentration. But the risk is much minor than it is in 5e because all your powers or your power slots regenerate on a short rest, which in Capes and Crooks is five minutes. So um, you, there's the, the risk of losing powers is only generally the lasting of the duration of a single combat encounter, if you would. Uh, for instance, I'll give you an at-will one. So we have uh, 
these uh, frozen aura. Basically, you radiate an icy aura out from your body that extends out to five feet in every direction, but not through total cover. That's it. That's all it does. But it requires concentration so you're not continually stacking or casting or whatever. But in addition, it takes that focus necessary to do it, and it just does damage. Mm. So this one says when a, a frozen aura is activated, all other creatures in your aura... A creature that starts its turn or ends its turn in your order takes damage equal to your proficiency bonus. No roll, no save. They just take it. So it requires concentration to maintain. Um, but there's no... It's an at will, so they can just turn it right back on if they, should cho if they so choose. Or if they are being pummeled, they might find another power to use in the interim till the guy that's kicking them in the balls is done. Or they deal with them or get, you know, deal with it. Because one of the players I had built a character with as many aura powers as he could find mm -hmm. to, to, tr to, to build. Now, he was still able to, after all the playtesting adjustments, he can still maintain up to three. But he got them from different sources. One was an at will. One was a superpower that didn't require concentration. And one was an origin that didn't require concentration. So he was still able to build the character he wanted. But I could, it stopped him from doing frozen, uh, frozen aura, flame aura, and crackling aura all at the same time. <laughs> Which is what he was initially trying to do. Because he was trying to get all those auras on there that just do damage with no save. So then it became a problem. So concentration was a simple fix to that. But most of most of the at wills don't have that. Um, I would say probably eighty five percent. Only the really potent ones that run the risk of combining with some other combinations that just made it very broken. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's let's be honest. We're, let's be honest. Um, once you get once you get players once you once players get comfortable enough. In, mm -hmm. in the probability that somebody's going to try and break, going to try and break the system, in uh, quickly approaches one, and I am yeah. saying this as a vet, as a veteran of such glorious insanity as Pun Pun <laughs> and Godzilla and Orca Slayer. <laughs> Godzilla. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, so we were we were uh, we did find some of those where that was necessary. But we also knew that some people wanted to be able to concentrate on more than one thing. I specifically noted this more with the support classes than with the like DPS classes, I guess you could say, or damage dealers. So that came out, that turned out pretty well by just adding the enhancement. Um, because then it was there for the people that really wanted it. Um, and didn't, uh, it was a choice that they had to make to take. And uh, I think only once somebody actually took it, and that was to benefit uh, casting a healing-like aura as well as channeling a defensive shield, So, um, which both were support powers. So um, mm -hmm. does it get rid of it entirely? No. Did we try to address it? Yes, um, to the best of our ability. And we thought by giving most at-will powers not having concentration um, was probably the best way to do that. So you can cast a superpower with concentration and still have access to all your at wills that are going to be the big stuff you're going to use most of the time. Yeah. Now, when now the other the other big elephant in the room that I that I have to address is um. How many well, elephants do you got in this room, man? It must be a big room. I'm a big guy. <laughs> I'm, a, uh, I'm a big funny. guy, and because because of, because of people's adherence to tradition when it comes to dealing with. The D twenty system over the years, there's For sure. the, the these kind of things are inevitable, um, but no, but no, the I while while some of my colleagues are ardent defenders of it, I have never been a fan of the of of D and D's approach to the Vancian magic system, okay. the whole, the whole spell slots and stuff. And since spell you, slots, and since you mentioned that. You, you you utilize spells as kind of a framework for your power system. I am curious if the limitations are going to be the same. Define what you mean by limitations. No, there's no uh, there's no component requirements or any bullshit like that. No verbal requirements needed. None of that stuff. Well, I, f I figured I figured that limitation wasn't going to be wasn't going to be a factor. But I'm more referring to. The question of are you having power slots across levels and ha and leveling the um, powers? Yes, but only the superpowers. Um, so the big concern that we had originally when we developed it 
was, well, how are they going to feel super if they can only do it sometimes? Mm -hmm. um, so we're like, well, that's simple. We'll just make the short rest five minutes and they get them back basically between every fight. There's only signature powers that do not come back during a, a, a short rest, which are the equivalent of like ninth level spells, I guess you could say. Um, those are the only ones that only come back after a long rest. Uh, but the rest, you're almost your entire toolkit is available to you in most situations every time you need them. Uh, the only lim reason for the limitation was to balance out at wills, something they can use indefinitely, versus something that took a little bit more out of them. A good example would be Superman is single-handedly one of the strongest heroes in all of comics. And even he gets worn out and tired and exhausted when the same battle is ongoing indefinitely mm -hmm. and so we thought that power slots were the best way to capture that now we are currently testing the idea of allowing a person to accept a level of exhaustion in replace of replenishing their power slots so that they can push themselves beyond what they would normally be able to do for those big boss fights um this is something that's currently only in discussion has not been added to our playtest booklet yet for the backers when it funds mm -hmm. but it's something that we think does tackle that concern because while it's the big boss battle i'll probably get to rest after this so i'm willing to um try to draw out the last inch of power that i may or may not have you roll a d, d uh, a d20 and make a, d a 10 con save and if you succeed you regenerate your power slots for that for that round at the cost of exhaustion and that's currently kind of how we're uh, dealing with that. But most of the time, it's not a problem, once again, because they get to go into most battles with all their arsenal at their disposal, mm -hmm. which is something that isn't true for traditional spellcasters in 5e. Um, the longer the chains of battles are, the more worn out and useless they're going to be. And we didn't want that. We wanted our at-wills to be pretty potent with or without the other superpowers that go with them, which is why we did the increased damage and scaling and stuff with them. But we also wanted the superpowers to be strong enough and different enough that when you do use them, you can feel it on the battlefield. Mm -hmm. So, um, which I mean, I would love to hear your thoughts on the my response to that. Well, I know that uh, it's something we're just tinkering with. I I am um, when it when it comes to when now when it comes to the idea of of utilizing. Um, utilizing the whole take a level of exhaustion, I am completely in favor of that simply because I do, um, I do, I, I, I have argued for the longest time that a big problem I have with a lot of, a lot of, a lot of features and a lot of, um, a lot of abilities in vanilla 5e is that the main limiter is short rest, long rest, once per short rest, once per long rest. And, a lot and a lot of a lot of times the effect that you're getting with it does not um does not warrant that kind of cost like if you, if all that you're getting is a, is just you roll advantage on a specific action but you can only do it once per um once per short or long rest that's that's not powerful enough for something that's for something that you're only going to be able to do once for that amount of time and that really comes through on the frenzy mechanic of the barbarian mm -hmm. which trades off uh an extra action for a level of exhaustion that most people aren't willing to do, which is funny because I'm in a show right now where I'm running a barbar berserker barbarian, and it hasn't been a problem yet, but we'll see. Yeah. <laughs> what, I'm, what, I'm say what I'm saying is that it, that with with something like exhaustion, you have uh, you have a you have a you have a pool to draw from that's already inbuilt to mm -hmm. to, util to utilize some some sort of restriction, so you don't have to fall back on 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 the rest issue. The other For thing, sure. the other thing that um, I am internally laughing about, based on based on how you describe the framework of at will superpowers enhancements and what and whatnot, which we haven't gotten to enhancements yet, we'll probably get to that in a minute, is how much I am being reminded of of the of the AEDU setup in fourth edition, i.e., the edition everybody hates, but but me. You're not alone, man. Oh. Two of the three of us on our show absolutely adored 4th edition for what it was. Mm -hmm. A tactical RPG. Yeah. Um granted I th granted I think I've um I've made clear 
in some in some of my past remarks that I think the I think the um video game accusation was um was was way too, was way too hyperbolic but I'm For getting sure. ahead of myself um now when it, <laughs> now when it comes to when it comes to enhancements um one of the I can it it mentions on the Kickstarter that these are passive and active abilities that can enhance your core theme yes um, so one one of the key things that I'd, that I'd have to ask is are enhancements also utilizing the um, utilizing the fra the framework of spells that we've dis that we've discussed when it comes to at wills and superpowers, or are or are they using something simpler? They would be more akin to like many feats, if I had to say anything. Um, let me let me go through here and give you some exam examples because um, it's not like the. It, it, yeah, the more the more accurate would be something like a mini feat. So, uh, when you pick an enhancement, it's something that's supposed to be unique, something in your character that fits the theme you're going for. So, I can use all the powers and stuff to build me the perfect uh, brutish Hulk character, mm -hmm. but that's not going to help me with. Uh, hey, maybe I want him to be like the Hulk, and I want him to be a scientist. Well, Professor okay, so Hulk. I can. Yeah, so I can pick. The brute role, I can pick the uh, genius origin, and then I might, to top it off, might pick the uh, enhancement. Uh, well, I gotta, I gotta scroll and find out where what it's called because I forget. Uh, da -da -da. The sage enhancement, for instance, mm -hmm. um, which I'm gonna have to change the name later. That was uh, something that's a while ago, but it says you gain proficiency in the arcana, which is now called lore mm -hmm. and investigation check. Uh, we got we compi compiled uh, Arcana, religion, and history into one called lore. But anyway, so you you gain proficiency in lore and investigation skills. You gain three adept points whenever you make an ability check using lore or investigation. You can spend one adept point and add a d6 and add the result, add it to the result. You can choose to spend a number of adept points uh, when you roll a die but before you know the outcome is determined and you regain all expended during a long rest. So this is a enhancement that is clearly geared toward skill checks. Mm -hmm. um, and that's not the only one. Expertise is also an option, which basically lets you double your proficiency bonus for something. So um, there's more to them than just the combat focused ones. But don't get me wrong, there are some of that. Maybe that's something all you care about. So you might be able to put pick uh, precision, for instance. So when you ro roll attack damage, every die in a one is treated as a two. Mm -hmm. So when somebody's rolling a weaker set of powers, that could be super, that could be a significant up in damage. Or maybe you decide, um, I want more power, <laughs> you know, and so you spend less effort on focusing on new and engaging powers by mm -hmm. giving up a weaker power for more powerful abilities. So you can increase your number of power slots, but you reduce your at wills known. So if you're looking for the more stomping power and less versatility, you can pick that up. Mm -hmm. And that would be an example of a more passive one. Same thing with marksman that gives you plus two bonus when you make uh, ranged uh, weapon and power attacks. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of, we wanted those to fill an area that could be more focused towards combat or skills and not just like m some of the, uh, core powers are usually combat related. Mm -hmm. Mostly how D and D works anyway. Yeah. So. Now within the, with, within this particular set setup, we've, we've discussed, we've discussed a lot of, um, a lot of power sets that could be considered inherent, but mm -hmm. there, but there is there is one uh, there is one other major archetype that we that we see a lot that we see a lot in superhero fiction that I do want to address, and that is the gadgeteer approach. The per, the person yes! who the person who who um otherwise is otherwise is a is a normal human, but is augmenting their their abilities using um. Mm -hmm. Using tools, whether whether it be whether it be in a, an array of in an array of gadgetry or a full or a full on suit, um, it's still under the same ge general ge general tech based principle. Right. Um. How is how is that kind of thing handled? And there will be a side question to to this afterwards, but I want to get to this one first. 
So are you asking when they don't have their gear or equipment or anything like that? Or just how does it work mechanically? Because um, we do have the Gadgeteer, which honestly is my personal favorite right now. <laughs> and I, did you see the, the backer email that just went out about it? I did, I did not. Oh, I ju I literally ju like two minutes before this, I was writing up the article for the the update on the gadgeteer. So I thought that's where that stemmed from. But no, uh, no that's oh, yeah. that's co that's coincidental. Um, <laughs> I'll, pr so, I'll probably end up I'll probably end up looking that at that when I when <laughs> I cl when I close out. So for the purposes of the game, the gadgeteer is just a role. Um, so you, if you really wanted to go with that very normal person, mm -hmm. um, one of the things that was recommended to us, um, and we haven't done it yet is somebody thought that we should have, a, a, a special alter ego for somebody who wasn't trying to hide themselves. But one of the ones we have is the average Joe. Um, and so you could do the average Joe who maybe you pick the genius origin. Mm -hmm. And so you somehow got smarter and you just started tinkering with stuff. And next thing you know, you've got these cool things for the gadgeteer. Um, we wanted it to truly be inspired by a, a successful pet class um, because D and D doesn't really have one right now. Um, as far as I know, the closest thing I'd say would be the artificer. Um, yeah. Which, which, um, which has a tumultuous history at that at, I guess the I guess the other one would be the Ranger, which has been which has been the most cursed class in the in yes. the edition's entire run. In the uh, in the article, I actually talk about how we took inspiration from the Beastmaster, but offer also leveraged the fact we know what people don't like about it mm -hmm. to build this class or this role. So what we did for this, basically, once you be at level one, when you choose your gadgeteer role, um, you're able to release small robotic drones as a bonus action to an unoccupied space within 30 feet of you. And when you conjure the or summon or or release the drones each unique drone of the drone systems you choose has a different feature and power and effect that it does mm -hmm. for instance if you um kind of like uh the the battle master fighter uh has a really large list of maneuvers but you can only pick a few mm -hmm. that was inspiration for our drone system design so there is a list of currently nine different drones you can pick but you can only have, I think, to a maximum of three different ones, and they all do different things. So the gravity drone, for instance, um, you can move it around as a bonus action, and as soon as you deploy it, it hinders movements of all creatures within a 15-foot radius around it. So that would be a drone for somebody who wants battlefield control, slow down the enemies, um, etc. Mm -hmm. We have uh, other ones like the, uh, the lure drone that redirects powers, of ranged attacks towards it so it draws them in with you know science <laughs> i don't have a fancy spiel to go with that but it uses its scanners and stuff and redirects and draws attacks to it now that kills it but this is something that can be done almost all the time mm -hmm. so it becomes a way to protect somebody so if i know our quote-unquote healer or our tank or whoever is in the party is going to die my gadgeteer releases a lure drone and has it hovering within the vicinity that drone is going to absorb the next big ranged attack that comes at it so that's very much a defensive ability mm -hmm. um but of course some people want a little more offense who doesn't want their drones blasting stuff out of the sky right mm -hmm. so of course we have the blaster drone that's kind of uh uh, equipped with uh, laser destructors, but because they can do it as a bonus action, it only does uh, uh, like a 1d6 damage, which isn't very much early on, but as you level up, it does scale. But remember, because the Gadgeteer is using their bonus action to do this stuff, they still have their regular actions to uh, attack and do other things, so that kind of gets compiled on top of it. Kind of similar in vein of like the Hunter's Mark, I would say, mm -hmm. uh, where it's just a little bit extra damage, but this thing's shooting independent. Um, they are immune to AoE effects. They come with their own little shield, so there's no uh, risk of somebody sending out a shockwave and just killing your drones. But they can be targeted and destroyed. They only have one hit point, so they go down pretty quick. Mm -hmm. uh, but that was kind of the direction we took for the core focus. They also get, you know, Ambro Surge, which is like a, a nanite healing. Um, they can, you know, use their drones to inject uh, uh, small, you know, uh, uh, this Ambro uh, fluid into the allies to heal them. Mm -hmm. They get targeting assist. They get uh, acclivity boots, which are anti-gravity boots. Mm -hmm. um, they get automated defense, so when somebody starts shooting at them, their drones, they can use the reaction for their drones to destroy and, and reduce the 
try to intercept the blows. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, our personal favorite is what gadgeteer isn't going to build their own combat droid, right? Yeah. So at level 14, you can transport your battle droid of your creation and design from your home, from your base, from wherever it is you decide it's at. Um, one, one of my players had it in space, and he said it was very much like the drones from uh, Far From Home, where it just kind of flows down from space. Um, and it, you know, it teleported where he needed, and he had this you know, CR4 drone uh, just destroying shit. <laughs> yeah. So that's the kind of the direction we took it with the role. Obviously, there's powers and enhancements that can further augment that play style. Mm -hmm. Now... With with a, now um obviously the, obviously the na the nature of superhero fiction um ha has it where there's mu there's multiple avenues that ca that can be taken and that's one that's one of the other things I wanted to address so if some if somebody if somebody wanted now obviously certain ages um within within superhero comics that's e that's easily workable if somebody wanted to do more atomic age or something like that that's e that's mm -hmm. easily modelable but one um one that's been particularly tricky to work with especially in long term campaigns because people are inevitably going to be leveling up is street level and okay. since you, since you cut your teeth on spawn this is this is something that you should be very familiar with yeah um, love me love me some street level fighting whole defenders level stuff too right yeah def um defend defenders truth truth be to truth be told um if there's if there's one if there's one missed opportunity when it came to the netflix end of the mcu it's that we never is that we never got the proper heroes for hire right um that sucks i was hoping for that i mean <laughs> anyways yeah <laughs> but but that that's that's one that's one that's one particular avenue obviously um Spawn is spawn is borderline street is borderline street level um and there there's been plenty there's been plenty of others that that are on that particular tier there was that short lived the cape series on it on NBC a few years back I do remember that I kind of like that mm -hmm. it's kind of corny <laughs> but yeah. I loved it um well well yeah well the, well the well you had the whole thing the yeah the whole thing where the mentor was running a circus so corniness right. is inevitable <laughs> right <laughs> but how but um how would how would some would um would capes and crooks be be able to accommodate that particular style of superheroes yes and the reason i can say that is because as the overseer or game master you have control over progression if you sit down at session zero and talk to your party hey i'm thinking of run a superhero campaign Oh, good. We all described it's decided it's going to be street level. You can run an entire campaign from level one to five and not have to go into the higher tiers. Mm -hmm. um, I would say that's 100% within the bounds of the system. So long as you keep that in mind when you decide how long you're going to run and how you're going to progress. The um, and that really comes down to each individual table. Um, and let's be honest, most games don't go too high into the higher tiers anyway. Mm -hmm. I think one of the notes that I put down to, to flesh out was if you want to run the cosmic level stuff right from the beginning, just start at a higher level <laughs> and go there. You guys are already a team. Here's, you, know, you start at level 15. You're defending the entire you know, galaxy or the world or whatever. Um, but in or if you want that to work... It's well within the first five levels to do that mm -hmm. and run an entire campaign. In fact, our uh, adventure that's coming with it, one of the adventures that comes with the Kickstarter, is the, uh, it's called the, uh, <laughs> Don't Blow It. And you're chasing basically a bomber who is robbing a bank and is notorious for blowing stuff up. That is very much street level, but it goes from level one to five. Mm hmm. Um, and so once the bomber is taken care of, this new villain, you know, uh, reveals himself and okay, oh shit, now we got to go deal with that. Well, now we're level five, so we can slowly move and get ready to deal with that threat. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think, once again, I think 5e lends itself to that because we as the players can determine where we start and where we end. Everyone always assumes a campaign has to go from one to 20 or one to three. It doesn't. You can do an entire campaign in a small range. Just make sure that everyone talks about it ahead of time. Mm -hmm. Now, with the, with that in with that in mind, um, go, what, there's um, 
there's one per, one particular one particular avenue that's all that's always always been um always been tricky for for some to for some to implement, and that is if somebody if somebody wanted to do a stri- a straight up mar- a straight up um martial character I get I guess one I guess one of the big examples of this kind of thing would be some would be somebody like um. Not not Iron Fist because obviously he has his he has the supernatural bent, but so, but somebody on the level of say Lady Shiva or Shang Chi. Um, okay. When it comes because it's 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 relatively easier to to dif- to go with a diverse set of powers to describe a diverse set of powers when you have of when you have a very out there um, setup, but when it comes to yes. the more mundane where they're j- where they just have to be really good really good at hand to hand. That's where some designers have um, obstacles. So I'd be right. curious how how an archetype like that would um, would work within your system. So that once again would come down to the player, but we do have the crime fighter archetype, our role that's supposed to kind of cover all that. Mm-hmm. In and of itself, it has nothing out outlandish. It is inspired by it is. Basically, the crime fighter is the the for the all intents and purposes the fighter with some minor adjustments, um, because you literally can take the f- crime fighter features and ensure you pick powers that are more mundane, like um, you know doing regular attacks if you want. You don't even have to pick a special at will if you don't want to. Some of the at wills are support like healing and stuff. Um, one of them I think is anesthetic, so you could take that as a, something your hero would have, something to bandage up people. In the same while, take the crime fighter archetype that gives you choices between, you know, the unarmed combat, the marksman fighting style. Maybe you're fighting like uh, Green Arrow with a bow, mm-hmm. though I do really want to build an entire marksman class. But you could do that with the, the crime fighter. You could pick up uh, traditional weapons, and maybe you want them to be a little more Green Hornet-like, right? You maybe give them a pistol. Um, you can do that with the crime fighter, and it, it's designs. It, it was designed specifically to cover that generic non-magic user. So uh, that's one of the reasons we incorporated the crime fighter. Though we did have to make some changes f- because they have access to at will powers. Like mm-hmm. we had to move, we had to move action surge farther up the ladder because of its combination with uh, at wills and stuff. Just made it more potent than it already already was on top of the fact that action surge comes back on a short rest that you basically get every single fight for most uh most parts mm-hmm. the big one of the big di- uh things that we uh changed was the psychological warfare at level 10 you've mastered psychological manipulation of others your words and actions uh you know intimidate your characters and you can frighten people just by using an action and that was one of the big changes that we made. Of course, giving them unarmed fighting was another one because I don't think the fighter generally has that. But that was kind of the, the goal that we took. And then they can select powers and features that fit the type of crime fighter they want to be. If they want to fight with a, a, a staff, if they want to fight with a bow, if they want to fight with their hands, do they want to grapple people? Do they want to be able to support their team by taking the anesthetic mm-hmm. um, or some other at-will power that's mostly support? Do they want to take a superpower that's for tracking? Um, all those sorts of things really come down to the choices the player makes. So if you want to build a Batman, do you want to build a green uh, arrow? You can do that. You just have to pick the powers that are closely... Uh, um, analogs for those. Mm-hmm. Now, so. a lot of superhero games utilize some utilize some sort of drawback setup in, in order to demonstrate the price with with certain abi- with certain abilities, or in some cases, demonstrate how some abilities may be a bit more dangerous than others. Um, do you have anything similar to that with Capes and Crooks? There is currently nothing aside from the discussion for the. Uh, the exhaustion but the thing the players have to worry about with bigger power comes bigger explosions and if you remember early on we mentioned public opinion Mm -hmm. many times somebody has released an explosion in our play tests that have hurt innocents have destroyed property and has earned them unfavor public opinion so as the game progressed the players themselves and their characters had to learn is it okay for me to do this here Mm-hmm. Um, and that became a setback in and of itself for some of the powers. Using a, 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 lion, a, a fireball-like effect is great when you know you're not going to hit innocence or blow a chunk out of a building with people in it. 
Um, that's kind of where I think the closest analog for that would be as far as the weakness is the players have to be held accountable, and they will be. In Terra, um, the DRT are constantly hunting deviants who are doing stuff against the law or causing trouble. Um, so if they are continually doing this, the DRT have a hive mind as they're like uh, mostly you know automatons. So the more times your hero shows up and bad things are happening, the more the stronger DRT that'll start arriving. So there is kind of a detriment to using big booms mm. without paying attention to where the big boom is at, um, but it's not as direct as you get weaker. Uh, one thing we are, uh, we've been tossing around, we've got a couple ideas of having powers that drain your stamina die. Um, mm -hmm. Remember I told you we changed it from hit die. That was part of the reason because we want to do some powers that drain that as a resource. It might be a little more powerful in exchange. Like uh, one that made the most sense was a uh, some sort of overburn or overburst or something that hey, if you sacrifice a, a stamina die, you can add an extra a t die to your attack or whatever. Unibeam. Um, Unibeam, yes. <laughs> Where it drains, his, drains uh, uh, Iron Man's juice, right? Mm -hmm. So those are things that we are looking at and want to include. Right now, while we already have uh, 100 pages of playtest, we still have so much more to do. And I have to, I need, I need help. <laughs> That's why I'm trying to uh, hire out so many designers and writers to help grow mm -hmm. this because we really think it does have good potential while it isn't i'm never going to claim it's going to be the perfect rpg it still is based off fifth edition but we took a lot of what we thought could be improved upon to make it super and applied it to this capes and crooks um and i think the most notable thing is the monsters mm -hmm. um that's what makes that's what makes your hero super when you fight in <laughs> It's going to be a harken back to 4th edition. You're going to appreciate it. Um, when you fight, when you see a speedster fight a bunch of goons, what usually happens? Usually, usually stuff is getting tossed. <laughs> yeah, because they run around. Yeah, they, go ahead. They're, they're, not, they're not moving still. I'm, I'm immediately thinking of the 4th edition monk who can, who can, do, who can attack, it, who, has, who has a bunch of methods to attack and move, so he's going around the place like a pinball. Yep, we actually have a change change coming up to our uh, to our speedster that lets them move with reactions. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, once around, they can move their full movement at any time, not on their turn. So, but that's that's beyond this. Um, yeah. The the thing that's notable is the speedster runs around, knocks a bunch of people out by five guys, be down before anybody else even knows what happened. Mm -hmm. And so we wanted to reproduce that. So for that, we looked at minions from 4E, and we created what are called cronies and henchmen. Mm -hmm. Cronies are monsters you can just throw waves at your players, and they can just mow through them because they have one hit point, basically. And then henchmen go down in two hits. They're kind of like super minions. Mm -hmm. And uh, that idea allows us to continually feed m enemies into a big bad boss fight while they're fighting the boss without fear of it being too much. Now, if the players ignore the cronies, eventually they're going to die because the cronies still do the same amount of damage that you would expect. You know, I think if uh, our C the CR, we used it as a balance to determine their damage output, not how easily they go down. Mm -hmm. So uh, even though it's got one hit point, it still does the damage of a CR1, for instance. And so if the player characters ignore those, it will quickly flood them. We love waves, and we wanted waves of monsters to be tossed at our heroes. That's why there's so many uh, powers that have subtle AoEs in them. Mm -hmm. You'll see a lot of the at-wills as they scale. They offer some sort of line effect, cone effect, or um, AoE in general, just a part of its higher tier, so that it can be used to clear out cronies and henchmen. Mm -hmm. But it ain't always going to be enough. <laughs> yeah. Now... One thing, one thing that I was curious about when it came to when it came to the subject of drawbacks is, and this is a, this is admittedly a bit of, a bit of me um, doing doing some picking your brain on this. Um, mm -hmm. One um, one live, I'm a big I'm a big fan of tokusatsu, and one particular um, tokusatsu that I'm a, that I'm a fan of, and tokusatsu, if you don't know, it literally means special effect, but in co but in context, it's referring to things like. Um, common Rider, th things like Super Sentai or, or Power Rangers here in the States, um, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, one that I'm a fan of is Garo. Um, which, which... I don't know who that is. Um, which it, if, if you get the chance, I would recommend look, looking into that. It's, 
it's doing a tokusatsu approach, but with a little bit more of a horror aesthetic. Mm -hmm. um, the it's also it's also the reference to the armor that the um, protagonist is able to is able to summon in order to de in order to deal with monsters. Ah, um, yes. The ca the catch with the catch with that ar with that armor is because it's made of a material called soul metal, which is very volatile. He can only safely be in that armored state for ninety nine point nine seconds. Huh. Um. What I'd be curious about is is how you, is how you would um how you would replicate that those sort of those sort of time those sort of time limit like approaches to to some to someone's abilities like say someone is able to like say a speedster being able to overclock themselves and go and go ex and go far faster than they're normally able to but only at a only for a limited amount of time. All right, I just wrote that down because I really like that idea. I would say um, I would dig into a mechanic that already exists and once again expand upon uses of stamina die or impose levels of exhaustion should they uh, have that power for more. For a good example would be Rage. The Rage mechanic has a very specific stipulation, one minute. But hey, well, if I can double that length at the cost of exhaustion at the end of its effect, would that be worth it? Um, or triple it or something like that. I feel like... The 5e's uh, um, uh, exhaustion mechanic is ripe for the picking for that, mm -hmm. as well as using stamina die. So one thing we experimented with early on that hasn't made it into the playtest yet is uh, I mentioned having powers that you use your stamina die to enhance them. Mm -hmm. Well, going beyond that, what happens when all your stamina die is? I mean, you can't do it no more? Well, no. Give me a constitution save, and if you succeed, I'll let you do it. If you fail, I'll let you do it, and you suffer a level of exhaustion. Mm -hmm. And so, once again, you're not limiting their ability to access that, but there is a serious consequence for doing so. Mm -hmm. um, and so, especially in something superheroes where you're constantly fighting waves of enemies, that'll catch up to you really quick if you get too careless. But it's an option there when the player needs it, because uh, let we talked about one of the big things we talked about is uh, when somebody goes unconscious. We wanted to talk about, like, I think we originally called it heroic moment, but I think it's been that's been changed to something else. But mm -hmm. where when you go to zero, you don't just drop unconscious. You, If you want to stay conscious, you can roll a con save, and if you succeed, you'll stay up and you'll suffer a level of exhaustion. If you don't succeed, you'll automatically fail a death save and you have a level of exhaustion. So the player can then choose to push beyond their normal limit. So those are the kind of things that we're looking at, mm -hmm. but still need more play testing before we can say, "Hey, we want to do this particular thing." Now, did that, did that yeah. answer your question? Now we've d we've danced around it a fair a fair bit a fair bit of um t a fair bit of time here, but one one particular thing that I'm cu that I'm curious about that I think we should I think we should delve into is stamp is stamina die. Now, yes, how similar and how you mentioned that it being it being somewhat different from the typical hit die, aside from the name. How different is it? What what is it changing to the sandbox? Currently, mechanically, it does exactly what hit dice does. The only difference is is that we're going to use it to power other things, other powers, other features, mechanics. It'll be more of a resource that can be used to do things you wouldn't be able to do otherwise. Whether that's increase your crit range uh, for an attack, uh, stand stay up after you've gone to zero, um, whether it's replenishing potential uh, powers, that uh, maybe even casting an additional uh, spell of concentration. These are all things that we've kind of talked about and um, discussed of uses. But we we knew right from the beginning that stamina die wasn't enough. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, sorry, my wife messaging me. <laughs> no, no, wor no worries. Um, so that's kind of right now. Like I said, that's been kind of something we've been playing with, mm -hmm. um, and we want it to be. We're almost looking at. Uh, uh, currently, we're almost looking at an expanded uh, action list because you know you have an action list. You can attack. You can you know take a cast an a uh, spell or help or 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 something along those lines. Mm -hmm. Having an expanded like stamina list. Here's something you can do at the cost of uh, uh, a stamina point or a stamina die. Mm -hmm. Now, the higher level you get, the easier those are to use. Right. 
So that's where we need to get our balance straight in our practice. Sorry, my wife and her sister are leaving, and my dog is throwing a fit. But yeah, um, no So we're no still worries. we're still experimenting with that, and those, like I said, that's where we want to take it. But it really is going to come down to more feedback that we get as play test continues, and what's best of it. There was one class we talked about having somebody a class that's based off of draining their stamina to heal others, mm -hmm. um, which I thought was a really cool idea. Um, but that's not in, that's not gone anywhere yet. Other than it's penned on a piece of paper. <laughs> <laughs> so We have a lot we want to do, but it's starting to consume so much time that I find there's just like, I got to hire people to do some of this. <laughs> yeah. Um, which on that, on that note, um, what are you shooting for as far as the total page count? Uh, well into 300 because we want to combine, we don't want you to have to pick up three books. Um, we don't want you to have to pick up a player's guide, a DMG, a monster manual. We want it to all be in one book. Mm -hmm. So our, our count is going to be at least based on the, the pricing that we quoted and how many words we want. Mm -hmm. Um, basically we went through a bunch of our favorite pieces of work and kind of figured how much, how much many words each section was to kind of get an idea where we wanted to land. Mm -hmm. And it puts us at least at 300, probably 350 or more. But that was our, that's our safeguard of we're going to, it's going to be at least probably this big mm -hmm. um, because we don't want people to have to go get all this other stuff. Um, we want you to pick up the one book and be good to go. Pathfinder nailed it when they did that the first time. And I want to continue with that mantra. Mm -hmm. I'm not trying to eke out, Hey, well, you bought the player's handbook. Wait next year till you can get the monster man. No, I didn't, we didn't want to do that. Mm -hmm. But that's also why our uh, we got to hire a lot of work out because there's only two of us and we still have full time jobs and mm -hmm. monsters and stuff. While I'm, I need some experts to help with that stuff. <laughs> uh, man, it's exhausting. <laughs> so that's the plan. We're looking at at least 300 plus pages. Mm-hmm. So and I'll I'll certainly be keeping a close eye on how, on how on how it on how it develops. Um but with all with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come on to, to come onto my show and enjoy the madness. I hope I hope I earned a sufficient amount of cool points to be cold. Uh, I, I would give you another five. <laughs> you're you're closing in. The most I've ever given out is fifty, so you're doing pretty good right now. No, not 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 too bad. Not too bad for my, for my first go around. <laughs> that was great, Mil oh. Mildra. And anytime you see fit to return, whether whether it's whether whether it's to for, whether it's to further dive into capes and crooks, or or just to sh or just to um sh just to shit post about how much of a missed opportunity um Iron Fist was. Um, yeah, the right. Is, the door is always open. Um, for sure. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory. But it is encouraged. Ah, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there'll be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody. <laughs> That is the best exit ever. <laughs>